Good morning, everyone. Thank you to the sole person up front paying attention. <laughs> so let's do that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Much better. Thank you so much. Well, we would like to welcome you to the CMS 2018 Medicare Advantage and Prescription Drug Plan Spring Conference and Webcast. My name is Stacy Plisga. And my name is Kay Rabel. <laughs> and we will be moderating the conference for you today. This morning we are gathered here in the CMS Auditorium in Baltimore where the webcast is originating from. We have a number of CMS experts and sponsors who will be providing new information for Medicare Advantage and Prescription Drug Plan sponsoring organizations, CMS staff, and CMS partners. We would like to recognize all of our in-person and our virtual guests today who are joining us from all across the country. Thank you for joining us for this important event. Before we get started, I would like to review a few logistical elements that may be helpful throughout the day. Continuing education credits, including CCB and CMS CEUs, are available for today's events, and information on how to obtain these credits can be found in the conference guide, as well as on the CTEO website. Website materials are also available on the CTEO website listed on the screen. Or you can also find them at hashtag CTOCon on Twitter. If you have not done so already, you can log on to the site to obtain presentations to follow along with today's presenters. If you will encounter any technical difficulties, we have staff members available to assist you. Please use the CTO tech support at cms.hhs.gov for technical questions or concerns. Please remember, using an Ethernet connection instead of Wi-Fi or Google Chrome versus Internet Explorer may increase your webcast streaming speed as well as prevent delays. The Medicare Advantage and Prescription Drug Plan Spring Conference and Webcast will feature interactive polling sessions and end of session evaluations today to allow both our in-house and our virtual participants to participate throughout the event. There are a number of ways that you can participate. You can respond to the polling questions from any mobile phone by sending a text message, or you can respond utilizing a smartphone, a computer, an iPad, or a tablet by visiting the Poll Everywhere web address. If you would like to participate utilizing your cell phone, um, the first thing we need to do is get you to join our session. So if you would like to participate this way, please go ahead and take out your cell phone. Both are in-house in our virtual audience, if this is the way you would like to participate. And we certainly encourage everybody to do so. All right, then you are going to select your text message screen and create a new message. You will then type 22333 into the to or the recipient box. Once you have done that, you are going to type in CMS 2018 Spring into the message box. This is not case sensitive but please do not put any spaces in between the letters or the numbers. Once you have done that, go ahead and send your message. You will receive a message back that says you have joined the, 2018, the CMS 2018 spring session. Once you receive this message, you are logged into the polling and will remain logged in for the remainder of the day. 
but please note you can only submit an answer when the moderator or the speaker prompts you to do so. If you did not get that message, just go ahead and try again because you may have typed something in incorrectly. To enter your response each time a poll is conducted, you will simply type in the letter that corresponds to your answer and then hit send. And that will send your answer and you will see it on the screen. The other thing that we will be offering is evaluation questions at the end of each session. And these are slightly different from just responding to a poll. So when you are prompted by the moderator, you are going to enter A into the message box on your phone in response to the question, I would like to evaluate this session. You will then receive a message back that says, hello, please evaluate my session with a link. Go ahead and you will then click on that link which will then take you to the Poll Everywhere site. You will then choose Start to say that you want to start the survey. You will be presented with four questions, one at a time. So you will select your answer. And then you will hit Next to advance to the next question. And then after the fourth question, and you select your answer, simply click on Finish, and your response will be sent. If you would rather join Poll Everywhere via your computer, tablet, or smartphone using the web browser, you must first join our session. You do this by going to www.pollev.com slash CMS 2018 spring. You should see a page like the one on my screen. This means that the poll is not in session. The polling questions will appear when prompted by the moderator at the end of the session. To enter your response via web browser, when the question appears, click on your answer choice. When prompted by the moderator, go ahead and choose yes in response to the question, I would like to evaluate this session, and you will be presented with the link to evaluate the session. Click the link. It appears in a green box at the top. When the next screen appears, choose Start Survey, and you will be presented with evaluation questions one at a time. Select the answer and click Next to get to the next question. Submit your response by choosing Finish. All right, so we are going to give this a try together. And I see that some of you are already ahead of me. The question is, which emoji best represents you this morning? Are you the angry one, the happy one, uh, the sad one, or the very confused, frightened one? <laughs> so while you're entering your responses, you'll see that the bars will start to go up and down. Your answers are being calculated. And that's how it will work throughout the day with the different polling questions that the speakers will be presenting to you. So it looks like the most, most of us are happy today, which is excellent considering it is such a beautiful day. And those of us who are from the north can really appreciate this weather. We look forward to everyone's participation in today's event. For our webcast participants, if you have a presentation-related question, you're going to go to the SurveyMonkey link that was sent to you this morning with the polling instructions and enter your question as well as your contact information. We will either answer these questions today during the event or they will be answered by our subject matter experts and posted to the CMS um, CTO webpage at a later date. For in-house participants, we ask that you address your questions using the microphone in the center of the room. That way, all participants in-house as well as remote will be able to hear your question. If you have a technical question about polling, we ask that you send an email to tclagholtz at provider-resources.com. Um, provider 
And if you have a technical question regarding the conference or the webcast, we ask that you send your emails to CTEO Tech Support at cms.hhs.gov. We truly value your input, so we will be having a post-conference participant experience survey. We ask that you complete this survey either by following the link on the screen or by utilizing the QR code. If you have an iPhone, you can go ahead and open your camera, line up the QR code, and tap the pop-up window that appears. If you are using an Android, you're going to go to the Play Store, search for a QR code reader, tap to install it, tap accept, open the QR code reader, and then line it up with your camera and tap OK. We are so glad to have all of you with us here today. Uh, we have a very nice crowd, so we're very excited. Our agenda today is packed with subject matter experts who are excited to share their knowledge and their expertise. So let's go ahead and get started. Oh, but before we get started, I have one more announcement, sorry. Um, in the rare event that the fire alarm is activated today, we would ask you to please evacuate and report to assembly area 19, which is located by the back gate. So if it goes off today, it's for real. All right. <laughs> Moving on. So kicking things off for us this morning with an update on Medicare Advantage payment activities, including an update on Encounter Data submission from the Division of Encounter Data Risk Adjustment Options. Please help me welcome Shruti Rajan and from the Division of Payment Policy, Monica Reed Asante. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so today we'll begin with an update on encounter data submissions, and then I'm going to turn the presentation over to Monica, um, who will uh, present on uh, MA payment activities. So MA encounter data submissions. Um, we're now in our seventh year of data collection, and we've collected about 3.5 billion records to date, and that's quite a milestone. Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to go over where we are with encounter data submissions, um, looking at submission volume, uh, giving you a submission forecast, talking a little bit about our data integrity activities, and then um, just giving an overview of communications, which are part of those activities. Okay, so as enrollment in MA is growing, you can see that encounter data volume is growing with it. Um, the line on this graph shows enrollment and the bars show encounter data uh, submissions, the volume of submissions. And you can see the upward trend in both of those. Uh, for 2018, we expect to receive 800 million records. Here we have a bit more information on submission forecasts. Um, in March 2018, we um, collected 66 million records. Uh, as I said on, from the previous slide, in calendar year 2018, we expect to collect about 800 million records. And we forecast that from 2013 through 2018, um, we will collect about 4 billion records. We also wanted to provide an update on the encounter data integrity activities that CMS has been conducting. These are activities that um, help us ensure the completeness and validity of encounter data. And they also help us to support encounter data submissions from stakeholders. Uh, we have four categories of activities uh, in our integrity plan. Um, their analysis, communications with MAOs, 
monitoring, and compliance. Today, we wanted to provide an overview of the work CMS has been doing on communications related to encounter data submissions. So we undertake a number of, of communications activities with stakeholders, and um, the activities are aimed at trying to get feedback um, as well as providing guidance and technical assistance to continually improve the encounter data submission process. And recently, uh, CMS has been providing guidance on encounter data submissions, and, and most of these communications have come through HPMS memos. Um, here we have a list of the uh, various uh, topics of guidance that we've um, discussed in these memos, uh, population of specific data fields, submission of NPI, the Medicare card project, use of chart review records, and um, in coming months, we will be releasing a consolidated encounter data submission guide and um, uh, sort of developing a more user-friendly CSSC operations website. And with that, I'll hand it over to Monica to talk about payment activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shruti. So in addition to providing an update on encounter data submissions and volume and our communications, we also wanted to take this opportunity to discuss and give an overview of the risk adjustment model development work that we did over the course of the last year um, with specific attention to the Part C model that we developed for 2019 that we'll be using to calculate encounter data based risk scores. And that, mo uh, that model work was highly driven by the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, the Cures Act had risk adjustment requirements starting in 2019 and subsequent years. And many of you may be aware of the risk adjustment provisions in the Act. I'm going to highlight them again just because that was the focus of, of the body of work that we did. And so the Act required that we evaluate the impact of ad um, adding additional conditions to the model. And those conditions were for mental health, substance use disorders, and the various levels of severity for chronic kidney disease. In addition, the Act required that we take into account the total number of diseases or conditions of an individual and that we apply an additional adjustment as that number increases, with those changes being phased in over three years and full implementation um, in 2022. And again, this was really the, um, the focus of our work for 2019, really because of time. Um, the 21st Century Cures Act passed in December of 2016, and so we had to be very thoughtful in our modeling in order to get the work done so that we could um, meet the requirement of proposing and releasing the notice at the end of 2017. And so with the, uh, the sense of timing in mind, we thought that it would be helpful to share with you our process for model development. Um, to provide some context, again, around that timing and the, and the work that we did. And this is our approach to model development, whether we are updating the underlying data um, or even if we're you know, doing more in-depth analyses. Um, it starts you know, logically with the people. We start with the cohort of people that we're going to use to calibrate the model. We extract their diagnoses and their expenditures. Um, and then we apply the model parameters, including if we are updating the HCCs. Um, and then we run the models. We, we actually run the regressions. And that process is iterative. Um, it can be very extensive, especially if we're looking at different model parameters, um, as well as applying constraints to the model and any other adjustments. And then we analyze. We analyze the model. We analyze predictive ratios and the coefficients. And we ultimately propose, propose the model. And what we really wanted to highlight here is the timing, um, clearly because it's in red. Um, but it can take eight months if we are just doing a very basic model update, if we're just updating the underlying data. Um, and it can take up to two years if we're doing an update that's, that's really in-depth. For the work that we did for 2019 to develop the model that we're going to use to calculate encounter data-based risk scores, uh, because of timing, we had to do parallel treks. We did the clinical work, and then at the same time on a separate um, but parallel track, we did the, the work evaluating adding um, counts to the model. 
in addition to the work that we did for the 21st Century Cures Act, um, we also made some technical updates to the model. We updated the underlying data um, using 2014 diagnoses to predict 2015 expenditures. And we also aligned the method that we use for filtering the diagnoses that we uh, use to calibrate the model with the method that we use to filter encounter data. Okay, so the next few slides go into the clinical evaluation that we did. Um, we evaluated the clinical areas based on select principles, which I'll talk about um, in a little bit. But our initial step for the clinical evaluation was really just identifying the diagnoses that we were gonna focus on. And so for mental health, we focused on the psychiatric disorders that are in chapter five of both ICD-9 and ICD-10. Um, for substance use disorders, um, all of the substance abuse and dependence disorders uh, in the DSM mapped to three HCCs, one of which was not um, in the model previously. And so we focused our attention on, on that HCC and the underlying diagnoses. Um, and then for chronic kidney disease, CKD, um, there are four HCCs, two of which were not in the most recent version of the model, um, CKD-3 and then the combined HCC for CKD-1 and 2. And so we focused our attention again on those HCCs that were not in the model. Okay. So this slide goes over our, um, the clinical principles we used. We have a broader set of clinical principles. Um, they were released in the 2011 evaluation and we pulled from that these three select principles um, that uh, guided our evaluation of the specified conditions. And the first is clinical meaningfulness. And this is you know, really ensuring that the conditions that we include in the model are well specified that they're relatable to the other conditions that have similar levels of severity, um, and that they're predicting expected costs consistently over time. Um, the second one is a prediction of medical expenditures. And so we're looking for HCCs that predict a reliable estimate of expenditures. And again, that those expenditures are stable and consistent over time. And then lastly, um, we look to identify HCCs um, or conditions that have a limited discretionary coding variation. Um, we're really looking for minimal discretion in the coding. We want coding to uh, codes and, and conditions that are definitively diagnosed. So we applied those principles, those three principles, select principles, when we evaluated the conditions uh, for specificity and clinical significance. And as usual in this process, um, we consulted clinicians as well as treatment guidelines. Um, and there were instances in, in our review where there were diagnoses that could be better mapped. Um, they could be mapped to HCCs with greater specificity where they were better predicted. And we did that um, in those circumstances. We remapped those diagnoses. And so we assessed uh, for improved predictive accuracy, and we ultimately added four new HCCs to the model, as well as some additional diagnoses to an existing HCC. Okay, so this slide um, outlines the four new HCCs that we added to the model, as well as the last bullet there, which identifies um, some additional diagnoses we added to an existing HCC. And so we added HCC 58, which is reactive and unspecified psychosis. And this is an HCC when we were evaluating the underlying diagnoses, we found that they were clinically similar to schizophrenia. Um, as well as having a cost profile that was similar to schizophrenia. So in addition to adding this HCC, we regrouped the hierarchies to be consistent with that level of severity. And we also added HCC 60 personality disorders. And for both of these HCCs, the underlying diagnoses were um, relatable, well-defined, and the HCCs themselves uh, predict a substance, substantive cost. Um, and so for substance use disorders, we added some diagnoses for unintentional and undefined overdose, and we added HCC 56. And this was an instance when we looked at that one HCC that was not in the model, um, we found that it was uh, you know, more clinically accurate if we split out that HCC. And so that's what we did. We split that existing HCC into three HCCs. 
so that we could capture the most clinically significant substance use disorder um, diagnoses in the model. And then lastly, um, CKD. We added CKD3 back to the model. Um, this HCC is a challenging HCC um, because of the fact that the underlying diagnoses um, actually encompasses multiple stages, stage 3A and 3B, and we're aware that clinically the implications of those stages can be different, um, but they're encompassed in this one code. Um, but we're also mindful that it's a you know, well-defined condition and that for many beneficiaries, um, it actually does implicate significant cost. And so we added this um, CKD3 back to the model. Okay. So for the next few slides, I'll highlight the work that was completed to assess the addition of the count of conditions to the model. Um, and this is where we had to simplify things again because of timing. And so we had to do our initial evaluation on our older base version of the model, the 79 HCC version of the model. Um, and we also did the evaluations on a single community segment. Um, we did do it on the version of the model that was based on 1415 data and had the other technical updates. Um, and so we evaluated different, uh, counting different um, ways, you know, counting um, payment HCCs, counting all HCCs, and also how we did those counts. Um, so we did end up with, with models where we counted only the HCCs that were in the payment model. Um, and then we um, also looked at models where we counted all HCCs, um, HCCs in the payment model and HCCs that were not in the payment model, um, with some exceptions. And then we looked at different ways of counting. Um, so for example, we looked at models within both of those that had continuous integers. Um, we looked at models that counted using dummy variables. Um, and in, in both cases, we did apply the hierarchies before we counted the conditions. Okay, so something we always make sure we highlight is how we evaluate model performance. Um, predictive ratios have always been our primary measure of accuracy in regards to the model, and that was the case also for this, um, this evaluation, this work that we did. Um, there's definitely other ways to evaluate model performance. We're aware of those. We do look at the coefficients, we look at R squared, um, but uh, predictive ratios is our mainstay. Um, and so we looked at predictive ratios for these models, similar to the way that we typically do. Um, we looked at predictive ratios by deciles of risk, and in addition, we looked at predictive ratios for beneficiaries with multiple conditions. Um, and then to progress with our evaluation, we selected the models out of the various models that we looked at. Um, we selected the ones that most improved predictive accuracy for the payment HCC count model and for the all HCC count model. And then we merged in the other work that we were doing. So we took those models and we calibrated on a version of the model that had those additional HCCs. So that had 83 HCCs versus 79. Um, in addition, we expanded. And so we, instead of calibrating on that single community segment, we expanded to all of the full risk, the seven full risk segments. And as a result, we had three models that we moved forward with and provided information for um, in part one of the notice. And something that we do wanna highlight because we've gotten a number of questions about it um, are the, is the version of the model. We use the same clinical version of the model for all of, these, all of these models. And so the 83 HCC model that had those additional diagnoses that I talked about for mental health and substance use disorders and CKD, Three. That's the basis for all three of these models. Um, and the models are structurally similar. Um, you know, they have demographics, um, HCCs, interactions, and of course where they differ is the count, um, what's being counted. Um, so we have the payment count in the HCC count model. The count within the models functions the same um, in that it's yes or no. The beneficiary either meets the criteria or not. They're mutually exclusive. Um, we did start the condition counts um, based on um, statistical significance um, and having a positive estimate. 
And then we capped the counts based on um, a number of criteria, including when the count was no longer statistically significant. But this is an area where we also had a fair amount of conversation with clinicians. Um, and it was pretty consistent that when the condition count gets to a certain number, making that uh, clear distinction between um, the count, one count from the next is not clinically meaningful. And so um, most of the clinicians said around 15, 15 conditions is where, you know, the beneficiary is so sick or their, their disease profile is so dense that making the distinction between 15 and 16 and 17 is actually not, not clinic, uh, clinically meaningful. And so we took that into account when we were considering where to cap the counts. And so for 2019, we finalized the updated model that incorporates the additional conditions, um, as well as the technical updates I discussed, updating the underlying data um, and aligning the filtering of the diagnoses. Um, we did not finalize the count model for 2019, but we did um, express our intention to implement the payment count model in 2020 to be consistent with the requirements in the 21st Century Cures Act. Okay. Um, so I'm going to change tracks a little bit here and talk about ESRD. Um, we felt it would be remiss not to talk about ESRD since it's been um, a long time since we've updated this model. And the 21st Century Cures Act um, allows for ESRD beneficiaries to enroll in MA starting in 2021. And so this is beyond the current parameters in which um, an ESRD Benny can be an MA. So this would allow switching from fee-for-service to, to MA. And um, with that in mind, we thought that it was an important time to update the ESRD model. It hadn't been updated since 2012. Um, and we thought that it would be important to have the more current expenditures and the more current experience um, and get used to that prior to 2021. And so for 2019, we are going to update the, uh, implement the updated version of the model. Uh, the model is based on 2014 data, 2014, 2015 data. Um, and the only change that we made to the model was to um, update the application of Medicaid such that it's concurrent. And this is really to align with um, how we apply Medicaid in Part C. Okay, so we have received a fair number of questions for 2019 about um, encounter data and risk score calculations, how we're going to do the blend, which models we're gonna use. And so the next couple of slides go through um, that in detail. And so this slide um, highlights that we will be incorporating encounter data into the risk score calculations for all of the models with a blend of 25% of the encounter database score, and that will be supplemented with wraps and patient diagnoses, um, as well as including uh, fee-for-service where applicable, blended with 75% of the wraps based scores. Um, and this is with the exception of PACE, where we will continue to use diagnoses from all three sources in equal measure without waiting. Okay, so we're providing this slide um, really as a reference because again, over the course of the last month or so, we've gotten a number of questions um, just asking for clarity about how we're going to calculate the encounter database to risk scores, um, really specifically for Part C. And so uh, for Part C, we will calculate the encounter database risk score exclusively with the new risk adjustment model. So we will only be using the 2019 CMS HCC model to calculate the encounter database risk scores, which will be supplemented with, uh, with RAPS and patient. And we will maintain the use of the current version of the risk adjustment model, the 2017 CMS HCC model, to calculate risk scores with RAPS data. Um, and then we'll, we'll apply the blends based on those models. For ESRD, we're going to use, as I mentioned, the updated version of the model to calculate um, dialysis and post-graph scores. And for Part D, we are going to continue to use the 2018 RxHCC model to calculate risk scores for 2019. And so for ESRD and Part D, we're using that single version of the model to calculate the, the encounter data and the RAP space scores. So we'll calculate using that one version of the model, the RAP space scores, we'll calculate the encounter database scores, and then we'll blend them. 
Um, and of course, as I mentioned, for PACE, we're going to continue to use the diagnoses from the three sources, including encounter data, in equal measure um, without waiting. Okay. Um, so we also wanted to highlight um, the risk or run schedule. We extended um, deadlines for encounter data really to support uh, stakeholders having additional time to review reports and um, for submissions. Um, we extended the encounter data deadline for 2016. Um, in addition, we extended the encounter data deadline for 2017. Um, and for 2017, we also extended the RAPS deadline um, due to data submission delays that were faced because of extreme weather conditions. Um, recently, we also released um, the memo that we typically release annually, um, so we wanted to highlight that, that has the runs for the upcoming payment years, and so we recently released the memo that has the runs for 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, it includes an indication for whether or not we're including encounter data, which we are for these runs, as well as the submission deadline. Um, and then we also recently released the 2018 risk score um, rerun, a memo that outlines all of the runs, the reruns that we're going to be doing for the year, and we will continue to send the 30-day heads-up memos that we do um, with the deadlines. Another area that we wanted to highlight are the model output reports. Um, we did, when we were starting the Encounter Data Blend, receive um, you know, a fair amount of input from stakeholders, and we internally also felt that it was important to have separate mores um, for the encounter database risk scores. And so we did develop separate mores for every payment year in which we're applying the blend. Um, I do wanna do a little plug for our April um, webinar that we completed where we went through all of the more record types for the payment years in response to questions that we've received. Um, so there's information there as well as these memos and the plan communication user guide has, guide has also been updated um, and it indicates for each payment year which model output report we're gonna be using. So that uh, was our kind of model development year in review. We also wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about ongoing research that we're doing and next steps some of which is building off of the work that we did to develop the Part C model for 2019 that we'll be using to calculate the encounter database scores. And one of those things are evaluations. Um, the 21st Century Cures Act requires that we complete an evaluation of the CMS HCC model, as well as the ESRD model. And that's due at the end of the year. Um, and it will include a host of um, predictive ratios. We anticipate that it'll be fairly similar to the evaluation that was released in, in 2011, and that it will include um, predictive ratios for various groups, various levels of risk, um, and, and chronic conditions. Um, and then lastly, um, is our ongoing research for ICD-10 for future model calibration. This is another area where we have received, um, we know that there's a lot of interest and we've received a lot of comments on um, calibrating the model on ICD-10. Um, we are you know, fully aware that it's going to require a fulsome evaluation um, of the mappings um, for the HCCs and the RX HCCs. Um, we you know, understand that there's probably gonna be some reclassification that's going to be required because of changes in the clinical concepts between ICD-9 and ICD-10. Um, so we're, we're starting this work, and um, this is definitely an area when I went through the model development steps where we're really gonna probably spend a, a fair amount of time um, analyzing the coefficients and ensuring their stability. Um, so this is something that we are working on. And so that concludes our presentation. We do wanna take a moment to uh, thank our teams, the policy team and the operations team. Um, for all of the extensive work that they did in developing the models and, and the encounter data work over the course of the year and the work that they continue to do. So thank you. Okay, thank you Shruti and Monica for the update on Medicare Advantage payment activities. It is now time for us to go ahead and evaluate our first session. 
So if you would take out your smartphones and text your response, or go to the poll EV link on your smartphone, tablet, or computer. If you would like to evaluate this session, and we encourage everyone to do so, and you are participating by cell phone, enter A in response to the question, I would like to evaluate this session, and send your response. You will receive via text the following messages, hello, please evaluate this session, followed by the link on the screen. Select the link and you will be taken to the Poll Everywhere site. Choose Start and you will be presented with the evaluation questions one at a time. Select your answer and click Next to advance to each question. Submit your response by choosing Finish. If you are participating via the internet, when prompted by the moderator, choose yes in response to the question, I would like to evaluate the session, and you will be presented with the link to evaluate the session. This link appears quickly at the top of the screen in green, so go ahead and click on that link. When the next screen appears, choose start, and you will be presented with the evaluation questions, and then go ahead and select the um, your answer and click next to advance to the next question. Submit your responses uh, by choosing finish. Okay, our next session today consists of a panel of speakers who will provide an update on recent enhancements to the STAR ratings program. From the Division of Consumer Assessment and Planned Performance, please welcome Liz Goldstein, Sarah Gayo, and Elizabeth Flo Delwich. So based on requests from the industry, um, most of you are probably aware that we have codified the basic star ratings methodology, um, starting with measurement year 2019, and that will be for the 2021 star ratings. We have laid out in the recent um, 2019 regulation the different aspects of the methodology that will go through rulemaking um, each year and what aspects will be announced um, through the call letter process. We really want to um, let you know today that we appreciate all of the feedback we have received and are continuing to work to enhance the methodology. Um, for example, we received a great deal of input um, regarding the methodology for setting the cut points for the various measures. Um, we are continuing, as we announced in the final regulation, we're continuing to analyze that feedback and simulate um, different options so we can propose various enhancements um, through the regulatory process. We're also very committed to continuing to obtain input from the industry as we consider enhancements to the current methodology. So as part of um, these efforts, CMS's current Part C and D Star Rings contractor, which currently is the RAND Corporation, established a small technical expert panel, and it's comprised of representatives across various um, stakeholder groups to obtain input on various aspects of the Star Rings methodology, measures, um, and calculations. Um, RAN will be analyzing any of the recommendations from the TAP and recommending um, you know, feedback or making recommendations to CMS on potential future enhancements to the methodology. Um, in order, we've been, um, CMS has been getting a lot of questions about the TAP and in order to preserve the independence of the results of the TAP, CMS was not involved directly 
you know, with RAND, selecting the organizations um, to participate. But we want to let everyone know that input from the TAP will be publicly shared. And this is really an enhancement to our current procedures. So we will continue to obtain input and feedback from all stakeholders as we have in the past. So um, we are very committed to continuing to get input from the industry and you know, we really appreciate the input because it does help us you know, shape future changes. Today, um, we're going to be going over some of the key enhancements to the 2019 star ratings that were announced through the call letter and some of the additions we made um, through the regulation. So I'm going to turn it over um, to Liz Flodowich, who will begin talking about some of the enhancements that were announced through the call letter. Thank you, Liz. There are two new measures for the 2019 STAR ratings, statin use in persons with diabetes and statin therapy for patients with cardiovascular disease. Based on feedback from our stakeholders and the importance uh, for Medicare beneficiaries, the measure reducing the risk of falling will remain a 2019 STAR ratings measure. Currently, there are four star ratings measures related to appeals, two for Part C and two for Part D. The appeals measures rely on data submitted to the IRE. The completeness of the IRE data is critical to allow accurate measurement of the appeals measures. As detailed in the 2019 call letter, CMS has developed a methodology to determine reductions for IRE data completeness issues referred to as scaled reductions. The scaled reductions rely on the data from the TMP. The methodology first employs criteria to determine if a contract is subject to a possible reduction for IRE data completeness issues and then applies statistical criteria to identify the level of the reduction. The methodology is not a one-size-fits-all approach. The reductions range from one to four stars, and contracts with more significant IRE data quality issues would receive larger reductions. The reduction is applied to the associated appeals measure level star ratings, and the maximum reduction is four stars that would result in a one star measure level rating for the associated appeals measures. For the 2019 star ratings, CMS will continue to employ the Categorical Adjustment Index, CAI. The 2019 CAI values were made um, available in the 2019 call letter. This year, there were a total of seven Part C measures and two Part D measures that were selected as adjusted measures for the determination of the CAI values. As finalized in the STAR ratings regulation, the 2021 CAI values will be determined using an expanded adjusted measure set. All measures in the candidate measure set will become an adjusted measure. The adjusted measure set will include all star ratings measures that re remain after applying the exclusion criteria as listed on this slide. CMS remains firmly committed to developing a long-term solution that addresses any sensitivity of the ratings to the composition of the enrollees in a contract. We continue to collaborate with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. As required by the Improving Post-Acute -care, Post Care Transformation Act of 2014, commonly referred to as the Impact Act, the second report to Congress will be released in the fall of 2019. 
In addition, CMS continues to engage the measure stewards to examine their measures that are used in the STAR ratings program. The National Committee for Quality Assurance, NCQA, will be revising the specification for four measures used in the MA STAR ratings program. The specifications will be released in the 2000 HEDIS Volume 2, and they will require stratified reporting. CMS is considering how to best incorporate the information provided by the stratified reporting in future years. The Pharmacy Quali Quality Alliance, PQA, has put forth recommendations related to three adherence measures used in the Part D star ratings pro <coughs> excuse me, program. The recommendations will be included in the 2018 PQA measure manual and will be finalized in 2019 once PQA completes the NQF measure endorsement maintenance of the measures. Next, Sarah Gallo is going to uh, review the disaster policy. Thanks, Liz. <coughs> this next set of slides describes our policy for adjusting the star ratings for disasters. Natural disasters, such as hurricanes and wildfires, can directly affect Medicare bennies and their providers, as well as the Part C and D organizations that provide them with important medical care and prescription drug coverage. These may negatively affect the underlying operational and the clinical systems that CMS relies on for accurate performance measurement in the, in the STAR ratings program. So we will adjust the 2019 and 2020 STARS to take into account the effects of extreme and uncontrollable circumstances that occurred during the performance period. For the 2019 STAR ratings, the hurricanes Harvey, Irma, Maria, and the recent California wildfires trigger this extreme and uncontrollable circumstance policy. So I'll go through each of the different types of measures and the adjustments. For CAPS, given substantial ongoing issues contacting Puerto, um, enrollees in Puerto Rico and the continuing loss of electricity and damage to infrastructure in several areas, for contracts that operate solely in Puerto Rico, contracts will receive the higher of the 2018 or 19 star and corresponding measure score for each CAPS survey measure, including the flu measure. Contracts that operate solely in Puerto Rico will be excluded from the 2019 star ratings cut point calculations for CAPS. For other affected contracts, the CAPS scores will be adjusted to account for the impact of the disaster. Unlike the usual procedures for case mix adjustment, coefficients will be estimated using a difference in difference manner controlling for the previous year's score in the same contract. We will only adjust if the effects are in a consistent direction and the adjustment is advantageous to contracts. In addition, affected contracts with at least 25% of beneficiaries residing in a FEMA-designated individual assistance area at the time of the disaster will receive the higher of the 2018 or adjusted 2019 STAR and corresponding measure score for each CAPS measure. The adjustments for HOSS are similar, will follow similar procedures as CAPS, but the adjustment will be to the 2020 STARS instead of the 2019 STARS. And this is because the, the Haas data collection is lagged. The 2019 stars are based on data collected from April through June of 2017 for Haas. For HEDIS, reporting in June 2018 for the 2019 stars, for contracts that operate solely in Puerto Rico, they will have the option to report NA for all HEDIS measures. If a contract in Puerto Rico chooses to report any of these HEDIS measures, the contract will receive the higher of the 2018 or 19 star and the corresponding measure score for each HEDIS measure reported. For affected contracts that have service areas outside of Puerto Rico with at least 25% of bennies in a FEMA designated individual assistance area at the time of the disaster, we will take the higher of the 2018 or 2019 star for each HEDIS measure. For all other measures for affected contracts with at least 25% of bennies in a FEMA-designated individual assistance area, 
We will take the higher of the 2018 or 19 star with one exception, and that's for the call center measures for contracts operating solely in Puerto Rico. We will exclude these from the 2019 stars for Puerto Rico contracts. We will, in addition, be implementing a hold harmless provision for new star ratings measures, so this year for the statin measures, if the inclusion of both of these new measures brings the highest rating down. That is, for affected contracts with at least 25% of Bennies in FEMA-designated individual assistance areas, all the new measures will be excluded from the calculation of the highest rating if it brings their score down. For improvement, we will follow our usual rule where to receive a star and the improvement measures, a contract must have measure scores for both years in at least half of the required measures used to calculate the Part C improvement and Part D improvement scores. For contracts that revert back to data underlying the 2018 star for a particular measure, that measure will be excluded from the calculation for the 2019 improvement. And finally, we will exclude from our star rating clustering algorithm the numeric values for affected contracts with 60% or more of their enrollees in a FEMA-designated area for disasters. Um, these contracts will be excluded to ensure that any impact of the disaster on their measure level scores will not have an impact on the cut points for other contracts. Similarly, affected contracts with 60% or more of their enrollees impacted will also be excluded from the determination of the thresholds for the reward factor. However, these contracts will still be eligible for the reward factor based on the mean and variance calculations of other contracts. And now I'll turn it back to Liz Goldstein who will discuss the new Part C and D regulation. So I'm going to be going through some of the key changes in the regulation. So for adding measures, um, as in the past, um, we're going to you know, continue to review measures to add to the Star Rings program. We're going to, as you know, measure developers are thinking about different concepts, well, continue to let stakeholders know as in the past. So even, for example, when NCQA is doing development work and, you know, doesn't even have a measure specification, we will let um, stakeholders know that these are the areas that they're working in and solicit input that we can feed to NCQA you know, in the development process. I think that's been really helpful in the past to give them some early input on measures. So we will continue, you know, through the call letter announcing measure concepts or, you know, early information about measures um, through that process. We will, um, as measures are more developed and ready for implementation, we will announce them new measures through um, the call letter to obtain feedback. We're trying as much as possible to um, give advance notice. And so now that we're putting you know, new measures through the regulatory process, it's going to take a little bit longer um, to implement new measures in the program. So contracts will have plenty of time to get used to um, new measures, get used to collecting the data as well, have as well have some time to um, see their scores and you know start reacting um, to those scores. So I was just going to give you um, an example of the timeline that would exist today if a new you know measure is ready to go. So if we heard today from NCQA that they've developed a new measure and we want to um, go ahead and implement that in our program, what we would do in January 2019 through the draft 2020 call letter, we would solicit some initial feedback um, from stakeholders. And, you know, 
if it was ready to go today, most likely the industry has been hearing about it for a year or two because we do announce you know, these measure concepts in advance. In April 2019, as part of the final call letter, we would summarize the feedback received and announce whether we are proceeding with this measure for the display page. In 2020 or 2021, depending on you know, which regulation we use, we would propose adding this measure to the 2024 star ratings and that would be based on the 2022 measurement year. For the 2020 and 2021 measurement years, um, plans would be collecting the data and they would be part of the display page. So just to summarize, any new measure would be on display for a minimum of two years and before it gets into the star ratings program, it would have to be proposed through the regulatory process and announced prior to the measurement period for that star ratings um, measure. So plans um, you know, asked for more time for new measures. So this is sort of what the timeline is going to look like in the future as we introduce new measures to the program. For updating measures, and these are measures with non-substantive changes um, that may be announced by a measure developer, you know, prior to the measurement period, but sometimes during the measurement period, um, we would announce, as we have done in the past, through the call letter process. And non-substantive changes, it may be narrowing the denominator or the population covered by a measure. That shouldn't, you know, change procedures and, you know, how plans and providers are treating um, beneficiaries. Um, changes that really do not meaningfully impact both the numerator or denominator. Um, often clinical codes are updated, so that would not be um, a substantive change. If sometimes um, a measure steward may get questions from plans um, asking for additional clarification. So this would also be a non-substantive change or um, if we add some additional data sources that plans can use um, if they wish, that would be non-substantive. Substantive changes would go um, through rulemaking, and this would be a similar process to adding a new measure. So if there is a substantive change, for example, the population you know, is expanded for a particular measure. This would um, have to go back to the display page for at least two years and would have to be proposed again through the regulatory process. Removing measures um, from the star ratings program, these Again, um, we may, similar to today, remove measures, clinical guidelines could change, the measure may show low reliability. Um, these changes would be announced prior to the measurement period. Something that we've been getting lots of questions about are our new policy for consolidations. Um, as part of the Bipartisan Budget Act, um, we now are implementing this policy for consolidations that are approved on or after January 1st, 2019. So the first year that's going to impact star ratings as well as quality bonus payment ratings is 2020. Um, we had proposed already um, in the regulation to change this policy of how we calculate um, 
star ratings and quality bonus payments for contracts that consolidate. And the intent of changing this policy is to make sure that the ratings reflect the performance of both the surviving and consumed contracts. We want to provide accurate information to beneficiaries choosing a plan as we want as well as we want to make sure payments are accurate. So just to um, quickly summarize the updated policy, and this is for the star ratings piece of the policy. For the first and second years following the consolidation, we are basically using an enrollment weighted mean of the measure scores for both the surviving and consumed contracts. So for the first year following a consolidation, the enrollment weighted measure scores would use enrollment of July during the measurement period. We do have um, some exceptions. The exceptions are for the call center measures as well as our survey-based measures. For the survey-based measures, which would include the CAP survey and the HOS survey, the enrollment would be based at the time the sample was pulled. So for example, the CAPS sample is pulled in January of each year. So it would use enrollment as of January when the sample is pulled um, for the you know, relevant year. The call center measures would use average, average enrollment during the study period. For the second year following the consolidation, we would again use the enrollment weighted measure scores using, using July enrollment. The difference here though is for HEDIS and Haas, we already capture information from the surviving and consumed contracts in our procedures today. So that would continue. And then the CAP survey would include enrollees from both the surviving and consumed contracts. And this is just because of when the CAP, CAP sample is pulled, we can combine data from all relevant contracts. In terms of the quality bonus payment ratings for consolidated So in terms of the quality bonus payment rings for consolidated contracts, for the first year after the consolidation, we're going to use the enrollment weighted means of what the um, QBP ratings would be for the surviving and consumed contracts. So just to um, give you an example, for the 2020 quality bonus payments, and that's the first year this new policy could impact, it would be based on the 2019 star ratings. Um, and the QBPs that we show each November, so for this particular year, it would be the preliminary Q quality bonus payments that are shown in each PMS in November 2018. So it would be based on enrollment in their surviving and consumed contracts in November 2018. So all of you, I think, probably are aware, every November we release the um, preliminary quality bonus payment ratings to start the appeals process. So it would be based on those enrollment numbers. If one of the relevant contracts um, to a consolidation submits an appeal and you know scores change, we would adjust those um, ratings in the final quality bonus payments that are used for bids. So in subsequent years, the quality bonus payments will be based off of the star ratings on Plan Finder since 
we've already combined the data on Plan Finder. There's no need to do an adjustment for the quality bonus payments. It's just for that first year following the consolidation. Another change that we announced in the regulation is as part of our efforts um, to put patients first, we um, think it's critically important to listen to our beneficiaries and make sure our star ratings reflect the voice of the beneficiary, as well as um, to put um, more emphasis on access measures. And access and patient experience are critical from the um, consumer perspective in picking a plan. So starting with the 2021 star ratings, the weight of patient experience and access measures will increase to two. For questions, for general star rings questions, you can send them to the Part C and D star rings mailbox. For any data integrity issues for the appeals measures, we have a separate mailbox, which is Part C, D, Q, A. All right, thank you, Liz, Sarah, and Elizabeth for providing an understanding of the enhancements to the STAR ratings program. Um, we are out of time for this session, so if you have questions for these speakers, please go ahead and write them down, and you can ask them at the end of the day when we do the open Q&A, or for our virtual audience, you can go to the SurveyMonkey link that is on the CTEO website and enter your question there to be addressed later on today. If you would like to evaluate this session, please take out your phones to text your response or go to the Poll EV link on your iPad, tablet, or computer and enter A to the response, I would like to evaluate this session. When you get the link, go ahead, click on it, and then follow the instructions. Our next speakers will be providing a summary of the new policy for Medicare Advantage. I am happy to introduce to you from the Division of Policy Analysis and Planning, Heather Kilborn and Brandy Alston. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. So today, uh, Brandy and I are going to talk about Medicare Supplemental Benefit, Medicare Advantage Supplemental Benefit Flexibility um, and General Benefit Uniformity Flexibility. Um, oh, I'm do a slide. More specifically, we'll be doing the supplementals and the uniformity. Oh. There we go. So first I'll do a quick overview. Then I'm going to go through the supplemental benefit aspect. Um, my colleague Brandy will go through the uniformity flexibility aspect. Um, I'll do a quick mention of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So in beginning of CY 2019, but moving forward after that, there are two ways Medicare Advantage organizations are going to have greater flexibility when designing their plan benefit offerings. The first way is the expanded supplemental benefit option, and the second way is through benefit uniformity flexibility. We announced um, the uniformity first in the 2019 Part C and D rule as part of the preamble. Um, and then we did the supplemental benefits in the call letter. I believe we had a mention of the uniformity in the call letter as well. And then I think it's almost two weeks ago, it was April 27th, we released two guidance documents in HPMS. So if you haven't gotten those, please um, check those out on HPMS. They're pretty um, useful and beneficial. And I think they go into more detail than we'll go in today. So if you have any other follow-up questions, that would be a good resource to use. All right, so with supplemental benefits and uniformity, we also want to note, um, we've gotten a few questions, that these are both optional. 
So plans don't have to use the supplemental benefit flexibility or the uniformity flexibility or the expanded supplemental benefit options, but they are now open as options for plans. Another uh, few questions we've had is that if they have to use them together, we want to reiterate that these are both separate policies. So for the expanded supplemental benefits, plans can offer the new supplemental benefit options for everyone in their plan. Um, they don't have to use benefit, uniform flexibility to do that. They can just go ahead and do that. They can also use uniform flexibility separately. So if you want to use a supplemental benefit that has already previously been allowed, but target it to people with certain diseases, that's now available. Um, the third option, well actually, yeah, the third option would be to combine them. So if you want to use some a new available prime supplemental benefit, um, bear with me, I'm sorry. Um, you want to use a supplemental benefit, one of the newly um, eligible ones, one example would be transportation, non-emergent transportation for a supplemental benefit. You could combine that and only offer it to people with certain disease states. That would be combining the uniformity flexibility with the supplemental benefit expansion. The fourth option is you don't have to use either. So we are just opening up flexibility for plans um, and we're pretty excited about this. We think that this is going to allow plans to really target their benefit offerings and really focus on their different target populations because we know the demographics are variable everywhere. Um, and, and one other note we wanted to mention is that with our presentation today and with the guidance memos, we um, did not intend and nothing in those guidance memos rolls back anything we mentioned in the preamble or in the call letter. They just built upon them. Um, so we were more specific and gave more specific requirements, but the intention of those was not to um, take anything back from what we announced in the call letter. So if anybody needs clarification there. All right, so I'm going to go a little um, deeper into the supplemental benefits. First, I'm going to go over the primarily health-related definition for everyone. Um, then we'll talk about some of the supplemental benefit requirements surrounded by that. Um, and then I will talk about some of the uh, examples of newly eligible supplemental benefits. All right, so first, CMS defines a mandatory or optional supplemental health care benefit as an item or service, one, not covered by original Medicare, two, that is primarily health related, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today, and three, for which the plan must incur a non-zero direct medical cost. So essentially, there are three pillars to a supplemental benefit. And for your supplemental benefit offering to be allowable through the MA program, all three pillars have to be met. Um, and that's a good note to take while you're thinking of proposed new supplemental benefit options, that even if it meets what you might interpret as the primarily health rate of definition, it still has to incur direct medical costs. So it's a good test to see um, if you have any questions about a potential supplemental benefit. All right, so now I'm going to read you the primarily health related definition. Um, it's kind of a mouthful, so if you bear with me. A primarily health related per CMS is an item or service that is used to diagnose, prevent, or treat an illness or injury, compensate for physical impairments, act to ameliorate the functional or psychological impact of injuries or health conditions, or reduce avoidable emergency in a healthcare utilization. Um, so that's quite a bit. It's an expansion on what we had previously, um, and we think that this opens up the playing field a little bit, and kind, you know, actually kind of a lot. Um, we're, we're pretty excited about it, so we hope everybody else is too. So let's talk about some of the requirements um, on what that definition means for supplemental benefits. Uh, first, as always, a supplemental benefit must be medically appropriate. And it must focus directly on a health care's need, on a health, enrollee's health care needs. Um, so even if it's something that's primary, primarily health related, it might focus on one enrollee's health care needs more than it would on another. So it has to basically um, directly draw a line back to whatever condition or um, medical issue or health care issue that beneficiary is in need of. Um, and then finally, it needs to be recommended by a physician or a licensed medical professional as part of a care plan if it's not a service that's already being directly provided by a medical professional. And this would be in the case of over-the-counter. It's a good example there. More requirements. Um, for the newly expanded or all supplemental benefits, actually, um, they must not be used primarily for comfort, general use, or other non-medical reasons. That's not to say that um, a ancillary result of an item or service doesn't provide comfort, um, doesn't 
can't be used for other reasons, but the primary use of the supplemental benefit needs to be um, for health and not for comfort, not for general use, and not for non-medical reasons. And then finally, must not include items or services to induce enrollment. That one um, I think is pretty standard, so I doubt we will get any questions on there. And finally, we have CMS expectations. So we would expect organizations that um, will establish reasonable safeguards, as always, to ensure that enrollees are um, appropriately directed to care. And we also expect organizations will use this new expansion to make adjustments to their annual offerings based on the healthcare needs of their plan population. That's more to say, and I know that this is what everybody has been looking forward to, is that you will um, use the new offerings to focus your care plans and your benefit packages on the needs of your population, um, not to get enrollment, not for marketing reasons, but to better serve our beneficiaries, which is, I think, why we're all here. Okay, so now I'm going to go through some examples of newly eligible supplemental benefits. These are examples of benefits that we would have um, previously denied, but now um, under the new definition, plans are able, all MA plans, even non-SNPs, are able to offer them. Um, I also do want to point out, um, oh wait, never mind, that's the next slide, sorry. Um, okay, so first it'll be adult daycare services. And adult day services are those provided outside of the home at a specified location, um, and we expect those to be people who need assistance with ADLs and IADLs. And for those who are not familiar with the acronym, that's um, instruments of or activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. And all of the examples that I'm providing today are examples that we have by far had the most request for. Um, so I'm highlighting the ones that I think that plans are probably most interested in. We've gotten a lot of feedback in the RFI. We've gotten a lot of um, feedback and comments from the call letter and also in our mailbox about these examples. Um, so anyway, adult daycare services are now permitted. Um, we we'll also have home-based palliative care as a new addition. And this um, allows for Medicare Advantage plans to offer palliative care to those who um, would need it but don't quite qualify for the um, original Medicare hospice service. Um, to clarify, once somebody does qualify or um, opts into hospice, then Medicare fee-for-service would take over. Um, but anything that's not covered under Medicare Part A, Medicare Advantage plans are now able to offer as an option. Um, and this next one is a big one. We've had a lot of um, feedback or questions about this one. But in-home support services um, are now going to be permitted um, to an MA plan, um, as long as, again, it meets the three pillars of a supplemental benefit, we'll go ahead and approve that. Um, the big definition here is that the services need to be performed within the home only. Um, but otherwise, a personal care attendant, um, all the state re licensing requirements or any other requirements um, given by the state need to be met. And um, I think that one's pretty straightforward otherwise. Next, we have transportation. I mentioned this one earlier. So we'll be expanding the non-emergent transportation benefit. It now can be open to Part D services, as well as um, that if you're a Part D plan, um, an MAPD, or um, also for supplemental benefits and items and services. So this means that you can provide transportation to a pharmacy you to pick up prescription medication, Part D medication. You can not provide transportation to a grocery store or a bank. Um, because they, those are not primarily health related, they're more general use items. So just for clarification. Okay, and lastly, we have one final example. Um, this would be the home and bathroom safety devices and modifications. Previously, we had, um, it's outlined in chapter four now, where bathroom modifications were allowable for MA supplemental benefits. Um, we are expanding that into the rest of the home. So as long as it's specific, it's non-structural, and it's not Medicare covered, and it prevents injuries in, Ill or prevents, um, injuries in the home or the bathroom, you are allowed to cover it. Um, we think that this will help with fall prevention, and we understand and recognize from um, the research and all of your um, input that fall prevention is kind of a big deal. So we're expanding that throughout the rest of the home. Um, and we really think that um, these expanded supplemental benefits um, are going to help improve health care outcomes, and we're looking forward to seeing what plans have to offer and what you guys can come up with um, from the expansion. And so with that, I'm going to um, pass it on to my colleague, Brandy, and she's going to go over the uniformity flexibility. Thank you. Hello, everyone. 
My name is Brandy Austin, and I will be discussing our new uniformity flex flexibility policy, some details regarding this reinterpretation, conditions and limitations that apply, and allowable benefits. First, as you are all aware, CMS regulations require that all plan benefits and cost sharing must be uniformly offered to all enrollees in a plan. Previously, we've interpreted this to mean that MA plans must offer the same benefits and cost sharing to all enrollees. Effective contract year 2019, we have reinterpreted uniformity to allow plans to reduce cost sharing for certain covered benefits, to offer specific tailored supplemental benefits, and to offer reduced deductibles to enrollees that meet a specific medical criteria. There are certain conditions that apply to this flexibility. Targeted benefits must, and I repeat must, be offered uniformly to all enrollees with the specified condition or disease state. And all targeted benefits must be equally accessible to all enrollees in the targeted population. This is what preserves the uniformity of the benefits package. In identifying eligible enrollees, these targeted benefits must use objective and measurable criteria. So plans must follow the Medicare marketing guidelines for communication and marketing of these benefits to potential enrollees. Cost sharing reductions and targeted supplemental benefits must be for healthcare services that are medically related to each condition. Finally, MA plans must ensure that and must ensure compliance with non-discrimination rules and regulations when implementing this benefit. So finally, I'm going to talk about some do's and don'ts. Plans may reduce or eliminate cost sharing or deductible requirements for items or services. Plans may make coverage for certain supplemental benefits available only to targeted populations. Plans may offer targeted benefits to enrollees who participate in a wellness or care management program. Plans may offer targeted benefits to enrollees when they visit providers identified by plans as being high value. Plans may not reduce or eliminate premiums. Plan premium and Part B premium buy-down amounts must be the same for all enrollees. Plans may not offer targeted benefits on, based on socioeconomic status or any other state other than health status or disease state. And finally, plans may not reduce cost sharing across benefits, across all benefits for the target population. So with that, I will turn it back over to Heather, who will close it out. Thanks, Brandy. Um, okay, so finally, we um, do have to mention the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. Um, as most of you know, it's going to further expand supplemental benefits, um, but for the chronically ill, beginning CY 2020. So we just wanted to reiterate that the new legislation doesn't impact or change our reinterpretation of primarily health-related benefits that we're doing now. Um, but we will be adding on expanded supplemental benefits for um, even further for chron the chronically ill and we'll issue future guidance concerning anything additional um, that we decide or can have find that has been authorized by the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. So um, we definitely wanted to mention that and we've gotten a few questions I think um, earlier in the year. I think everything's clarified now, but just a heads up that there will be guidance released and we'll probably um, have another presentation next spring about this. <laughs> so, and I'm looking forward to that. So I think we're ready for questions. Um, if anybody has any, I think Stacy's gonna come out to moderate. Um, but I will say, um, before we ask questions, something we do wanna avoid today um, is asking about specific benefits that your MA plan wants to offer and whether or not we'll approve them. Um, we have a whole team of people that goes into approving the bids, and so I am just not, frankly, not qualified to do that on the spot today. Um, but feel free to ask any questions, just if you're asking like, will you approve this? I, I can't answer that. Um, but I am happy to answer anything I can or explain anything. Hi. 
Good morning. Thanks very much for a very, very clear presentation. My name is Howard Shapiro from the Alliance of Community Health Plans. Um, Heather, your examples uh, did not mention two areas that I think have been of interest. One of them is uh, nutrition assistance and food programs. Uh, plans are already, you know, sort of well down the road in relating food assistance to diseases such as diabetes, uh, as, as, an, as an obvious one, or other diseases that may involve uh, preventing weight loss. And then the other uh, area is uh, uh, use of telehealth-based services. Now, sure. I know that that issue is complicated a bit by the fact that there is recent legislation yeah. that will uh, uh, that will expand use of telehealth in 2020. But what about for 2019 in terms of using these new flexibilities? Um, those are really great questions. So for the first question to um, address the food or nutrition aspect, we do have weight management currently available um, as a supplemental benefit that's allowable. And all of this is outlined in Chapter 4. And we also have um, nutritional food and nutrition benefit that is already allowable under Chapter 4 too, um, but it's temporary. So it's for directly after um, a disease situation or hospitalization. Um, and then also, I think it's for, uh, we have to read Chapter 4, I'm very sorry. But it's definitely um, right after and it's on temporary basement. So it's basically part of a, a care plan. Um, and we have looked into the food and you are absolutely right that it's definitely a big area of interest for MA plans. And I can tell you that we're still currently um, reviewing all of that and looking into finding ways um, to see what we can do for MA plans to allow that. But for right now, the food benefit for CY19 is not expanding, it's staying the way that it is. Um, I think another aspect to that is that um, there's a lot of other agencies that um, deal with food and we sort of see it not that we see it as, but it's something we're trying to figure out the difference between right health and general use, and everybody has to eat. Um, so we will, we'll be, there'll be more on that topic, I guess, is what I can say there. Um, as far as telehealth, telehealth is also currently allowed as a supplemental benefit as remote access technologies. So plants can still offer um, their benefits via telehealth, via store and forward technology, um, email, all of that, but it has to be as a supplemental benefit. Um, you are correct that there's new legislation. The Bipartisan Budget Act also um, allows for telehealth, expanded telehealth benefits in 2020. So I can also say that there is more to come on that topic, and we're really excited about that one, too. Um, so at this time, we are opening up to the in-house audience for questions and also webcast participants. If you have questions, please be sure to submit them via the SurveyMonkey link um, that you received this morning. And as you step up to ask questions, please uh, let us know where you're from as well as state your name and um, we'd be happy to take your questions. So next question. Hi, I'm Marty Corey. Uh, I'm not sure which of you wants to field this question. Could you speak a little bit to the requirement for a recommendation from a physician or other clinician? I think it was in the, in the call letter, you drew a distinction between that and what we would normally expect in terms of, a, of an order. So if you can just elaborate a little bit as to what you're looking for and what, you're, and what wouldn't apply. Sure, I, I'll, I'll do my best, but I would suggest um, also submitting that question to our mailbox. You can submit it to the policy mailbox um, so that we can, I have time to collaborate on that. But I know that in the call letter, we don't have any um, orders per, like required for over the counter because that would be um, more limiting than what it previously was. But it does need to be recommended um, and there needs to be, I think, some sort of notation or something about um, why any of these benefits, if you guys are covering them, that they're directly related to a beneficiary's health and that they are medically appropriate. And so our way of um, making sure that that is complied with is making sure that it's recommended by a physician or um, a licensed medical provider. And that's really just to help us delineate the difference between primarily health related um, and some of these general use items. Because as you know, as we like we with the food, once we start getting um, into different ADL services or assisted services, um, the line safety devices is another one. The line's a little blurry. And so we want to make sure that it is directly related to a care plan and then it's helping improve the beneficiary's health outcomes. I hope that 
that help. But um, if you would like, and you definitely deserve a better answer than that, please go ahead and um, submit it to the mailbox. Thank you. Question, next question, please. Yes, hi, uh, Sheila Fusay from Navis Healthcare. And we're very excited about both of these new benefits. We think it's gonna be really good for the beneficiaries and really allow to address you know, some of the needs in the communities. Um, one of the questions that I have is both for the primarily health-related and the supplemental benefits for the home support, um, in-home support. Some of these um, activities are gonna require a manager um, to be able to be supervising or scheduling the care for the beneficiaries. Would that be something, the, the management or the scheduling of it be able to be in the uh, medical expense? Okay, I would also ask that that go to the mailbox, um, but I think generally, as myth man management, it would be treated as if um, any downstream entities in management of other supplemental benefits. So the way plans are um, organizing their non-emergent transportation for Part A and B, that's how it would be the same. It would be the same. Okay, thank you. Sure. Next question, please. Uh, Mike Adelberg, Fegri Baker Daniels. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion around the benefit flexibility and the uniformity rules for specific health conditions. Uh, there's also some discussion in the guidance around uh, geographic units. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the specificity around uh, creating uh, geographic specific benefits. So I think you're asking if plans are, labeled, are allowed to uh, target benefits based on a particular geographical location? And the answer to that is no. It has to be based on a specific disease state or health status. So everyone in the plan or segment with that disease state or health status would have to have access to um, the targeted benefit. Okay. Thank you for that question. Are there any more questions for our in-house participants? Okay. Well, thank you, Heather and Brandy, for providing a summary of the new policy for Medicare Advantage. If you would like to evaluate this session, please take out your phones and text your response or go to the poll EV link on your iPad, um, tablet, or computer and enter A in response to question one. I would like to evaluate this session and go ahead and send your response. When you receive the link, click on it and follow the instructions. Okay. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and go to lunch. Um, and we will begin sessions promptly this afternoon at 12.30 p.m. For our in-person guests, please visit the cafeteria located downstairs. If you pre-ordered your lunch, you can pick it up at Jasmine's Cafe, which is right outside of the cafeteria. So go ahead and enjoy your lunch, and we'll start back at 12.30 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>